This is our mission, to share the good news with everyone all over the world. Your giving in tithes and offerings helps us reach our area. Your giving in missions helps us support missionaries that are going out as God commissioned them. Will you help us in our mission by giving? On your screen, you can see two ways to give. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us the ability to share in your work, whether in our own backyard or the other side of the world. Thank you for all of these faithful givers and bless them as they give. Please protect and bless the missionaries as they continue to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. The universe is held within your hands and all the earth bows down at your command the wonder of creation will testify to all you've done from age to age your promises have stood you reign as king just like you said you would and every generation will testify to all you've done to all you've done to god be the glory to god be the glory oh you have done great things you will never change to god be the glory oh yes the dead can hear the broken live again the blind can see the sinner is a friend and love's renovation will testify to all you've done sing our hearts our hearts redeem when jesus rose again and all will know your kingdom
God so loved the world He gave His only Son Our debt of sin now paid in full Oh, the cross has overcome No matter what we face No matter what the cost With every single breath we take We to respond, respond to your love here. Look at what you've done, look at what you've done here. We're ready to respond, respond to your love here. Look at what you've done. Hello, fellow worshipers. It's good to meet with you again on this Lord's Day. So we uh, hope that everyone is well, safe, and comfortable. Give me a call on the phone. You can 
you're welcome to do that whenever you want to talk. And, uh, and we'll get together soon. It can't be long now. And we'll have a great meal. How's that? And we'll get together and uh, rub shoulders a little bit. All right, so let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we do thank you for this wonderful country that we live in. We thank you for our leaders who devote themselves to uh, keeping peace in our land. And we do ask for your guidance for the president, vice president, the governors, and all of those in charge of these major decisions about how we're going to conduct affairs here um, with this pandemic. So Lord, we pray against uh, this disease and, and this uh, flu. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you will just destroy it. And you can say, peace be still to this whole thing. And uh, we know that you have the power to do that. We ask you also, Lord, to forgive the sins of our country. And we pray that many will come back to you, renew their faith and trust in you, and live by what you taught us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture reading today is Hebrews 11, chap chapter 11, verses 22 through 29. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughters. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Well folks, Bob was in trouble. He forgot his wedding anniversary again. His wife was really angry. She told him tomorrow morning, I expect to find a gift in the driveway that goes from zero to 200 in six seconds, and it better be there. The next morning he got up early and left for work. When his wife woke up, she looked out the window and sure enough, there was a medium sized box all gift wrapped in the middle of the driveway. Confused, the wife got her robe on and ran out to the driveway brought the box back in the house. She opened it and found a brand new bathroom scale. Bob hasn't been heard from since. Well, we like it when people remember our birthdays. We like it when our spouse remembers our anniversaries. And Jesus didn't want his followers, the believers, to forget the price that he paid on the cross because that price was paid for the sins of the whole world and he wanted the whole world to remember so he told his disciples he said I want you to do this in remembrance of me now after the sermon today Maria Rands a ministerial student is going to be leading you in communion and so we would like for you to partake in that have a little juice ready and a little piece of bread or cracker and um, we are going to look at the origins of it so that we can remember. Now, we all know the story. We all know the cross. And we know what Jesus said at the communion. We've uh, heard it many, many times. But let's take a look at it again because, you see, we humans forget. We forget lots of things. And God doesn't want us to forget this because it's monumental. It is the very climax of history. 
when Jesus died for us, the sins of the world on the cross. So we want to just take a little look at this. Um, and again, we, we need to go back in time to the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, those were Abraham's two sons and the promise that God gave to Abraham, he gave again to Isaac and again to Jacob. And the promise was that through them, the whole world would be blessed. Jesus Christ was a descendant, of course, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he was the fulfillment of that promise. He is the savior for the whole world. So we want to take a look at the, the history um, Jacob, now, he was the father of 12 sons, and they are the ones we call the patriarchs. Uh, and so one of those sons was Joseph. Uh, he was the younger son, the youngest until, of course, his younger brother was born. All right, so he's second to the youngest. But uh, Joseph was Abraham or Jacob's favorite, and the brothers... The rest of the brothers were jealous of him. We all know the story of the coat of many colors that he gave to his favorite son, Joseph. And we know how his brothers uh, sold him into Egypt, and uh, they, they really wanted to kill him and do away with him. But uh, some said, no, let's not do that. So, so he was sold into Egypt and became a slave to Potiphar, uh, one of the servants of Pharaoh. And he prospered and did very well. We're not going to go into this whole story, uh, but you're welcome to read it in Genesis 37 on through 50. It's a marvelous story. It's nice to reread it. One of my favorites. And uh, so Joseph spent quite a long time in prison. And uh, while he was there, he met two of Pharaoh's servants, the butler and the baker. They both had dreams, were very sad one morning, and uh, Joseph comes in, he's, uh, he's in charge of all the prisoners because of how well he does things. Uh, he, he was promoted to that. So he asks them why they're so glum, and they each tell them a dream that they had. Well, when he tells them the interpretation to it, both interpretations of those two dreams came true. Uh, the one was executed, and the other was back, put back in his position by Pharaoh. So the... Um, the cupbearer, or the butler, he forgot about Joseph, even though Joseph said, please remember me when you get out of here, because I don't belong here. And, um, of course, he forgot about him in the light of all of his blessings. Um, <clears throat> until the day that Pharaoh had a dream, and he tried all of his wise men, the soothsayers, uh, the astrologers, and all of them, no one could interpret that dream for him. And so this man, the butler, he said, oh, my sins come before me. I remember this guy. Uh, he was a Hebrew in the prison, and he interpreted our dreams for us, and uh, they both came true. So Pharaoh has Joseph brought out of prison. He's been in there a few years. And um, he cleans up, shaves his face, you know, look, tries to look decent for the Pharaoh. Uh, and he comes in. So Pharaoh tells him the dreams. Joseph gives him the interpretation, but before he gives it, he says, no man can interpret these dreams, but there is a God in heaven who will reveal it to us. And so he interpreted, and the dream was this. The dream was that there were going to be seven years of plenty. There would be great harvests, and following that would be seven years of famine, extreme famine. And so Joseph suggests to the Pharaoh, he said, you should seek out a man of intelligence and ability so that during those seven years of good harvest, uh, all of that extra grain can be stored away in the various cities so that the people don't starve when the famine comes. And so the Pharaoh said, well, I think maybe I've got the smartest and the most able man right here in front of me. And so he has him dressed up in nice clothes and proclaims him the second ruler in the kingdom. So uh, this takes place, and Joseph is put in charge. The only one who's greater than him in Egypt is the Pharaoh himself. <clears throat> so one day he's a prisoner, and the same day he becomes second ruler in the kingdom. Awesome. 
Well, that was all good and great. Uh, then his brothers come to buy food. And, uh, you know, there's a, a marvelous story of how Joseph reveals himself to them. And then Pharaoh finds out. Pharaoh was so pleased with Joseph. He says, bring the whole family. Tell them all to come here. They can live in the land of Goshen and, uh, and they will be fine. So Joseph's whole family, 70 of them all total. Uh, come to Egypt and they settle in the land of Goshen and everything is fine until uh, Joseph dies and also that Pharaoh dies. And uh, the next Pharaoh, he doesn't remember Joseph. He didn't know Joseph. And all he knows is that these Israelites in the land of Goshen, they are multiplying so fast and they are becoming so powerful that he gathers his wise men together and he says, I'm afraid that if there ever is a war, that the Israelites are going to join the other side and then escape. And so he's afraid uh, to have them escape because he has put them under slavery because they were getting so powerful. So they build a couple cities uh, for him, uh, the slave labor. Ramses was one, and then there was another one, Pithom. And... Uh, he likes that slave labor. They get a lot of things done, built a lot of things. And so he doesn't want them to escape. Well, he puts the word out and gives an order, an executive order, for all the midwives in Egypt that when they are helping to deliver babies for the Israelites, that they kill every boy that's born and, and just tell the, tell the mother that he just died on delivery. Well, the midwives, they feared the Lord, the Bible says, and they did not do that. So then Pharaoh issues another order that all the people, all these people are supposed to throw their sons in the river and keep the daughters. He wants to uh, cut down on the population. So that's how he wants to do it. That is how we get this story told about Moses, how his mother saved his life by making a basket, putting Moses in it, and putting it in the river. And then we know that Pharaoh's daughter picked him out of the river. So that's how we end up with this situation. And uh, Moses, uh, eventually, you know, he lives in the palace, and he's part of the Pharaoh's family and all of this uh, that's happening. Um, but he decides that he wants to be with God's people, uh, even though they're slaves. He wants to identify himself as a Hebrew. And he rejects the pleasures of Egypt for a season and instead identifies with God's people. Well, you know how time goes on. Moses had to flee because he ended up killing an Egyptian who was fighting with an Israelite. And uh, the word got out. and He took off. He ran for his life. So at 40 years old, Moses goes and... Uh, travels a long ways, ends up in Midian, and there he marries, has a family. He's a shepherd, and for 40 years he lives the wonderful, quiet, pasture life. He's happy with that. He's okay with that. He's away from the busyness of the city, except that God meets him, and we know how that goes. The, he, the burning bush, God speaks through a burning bush that's not burned up. It's a strange sight. He goes over to see it. And anyway, God calls him to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. He said, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Well, that's all well and good. But for one thing, the Israelites didn't know anything much about Moses anymore. And the Pharaoh didn't go along with the plea, let my people go. No, they're his slaves. They're his labor force. Well, you know how... Uh, God sent 10 plagues to convince Pharaoh to let the people go. Every once in a while, I'd say, okay, go. But then he changes mind, no, stay. And so the 10th plague is the one that concerns us today. And that is the plague of the death of the firstborn. So God gives Moses directions and a command. And he says, on this certain night, the death angel is going to pass over Egypt and destroy, kill the firstborn in every house and the firstborn of all the beasts. And this is going to happen. I'm doing this so Pharaoh will let my people go, that he'll know that I am God. 
He already should have known that by the other plagues, but he was a hard case. He had hardened his heart. So on this particular day, God told Moses to have all of the people in the land of Goshen, all the Israelites, are to kill a lamb. And they are to uh, spread paint, the blood from the lamb on the doorpost, the side posts and on the lintel. And he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And so that's what the Israelites did on that particular day that God had chosen. And they killed the lamb. They spread the paint, the paint, the blood on the doorposts and on the lintel. And that night at midnight, the angel of the Lord went through Egypt. And the firstborn in every house died, and the firstborn of all the beasts died. There was not one death in the land of Goshen where the Israelites dwelt because they all did what Moses commanded. And they had the blood on the doorposts of their house. They were told, don't anyone leave the house. Only those who are inside will be saved. And everybody made sure to keep all their kids in that night. And um, they were spared and they were saved. But at midnight, when that death angel went through Egypt, there was a great cry that went out from all the houses in Egypt because everyone had someone dead. And now they pled with Pharaoh, and Pharaoh himself called for Moses and Aaron and said, Take your people, leave, get out now. And he really wants them gone. Changed his mind later because he was going to miss that slave labor. But for now they're told to leave, and they gather all their belongings, and off they go. So this is what God did not want them to forget. After they were gone, they had left Egypt, they were in the wilderness, God gave them seven feast days to uh, observe throughout the year. And the first one was the Passover. Every year they were to uh, kill a lamb again, a year old and, and without blemish. That was perfect. And they were to remember what God had done for them, that he had taken them and led them out of slavery, gave them freedom from slavery, and brought them out. And so uh, he did not want them to forget. And so the Jews all over the world today still celebrate the Passover and remember that God brought them out of Egypt. Now when it comes to Jesus Christ in the New Testament, son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the son of David, um, he institutes before the crucifixion at the Last Supper, he institutes the communion to be observed. And he has the wine and the bread, symbols of his broken body and his shed blood. And he says, this do in remembrance of me. They still don't have it all straight that he's going to die. They don't understand, though he's told them three or four times, that he would be given into the hands of sinful men and, and would die and would rise again. But they thought it was symbolic. So many of his parables and so on were. They didn't understand. <clears throat> But they remembered all these things and they kept this up. And so communion has been observed in Christianity since that time. And what is it for? It is to remember. So when we take the bread and the wine, the juice, the fruit of the vine, when we take that now, we are remembering what Jesus did. It's important to keep in mind that when we take communion, it's not saying how holy we are. It is telling us how much Jesus loved us to give his life a ransom for all of us. It does mean, however, that we love him and believe that he is the Savior of the world and the Son of God, and we have committed our lives to him, to live for him, to believe in him. All right, so uh, everybody, I hope that you take part in communion with us today, um, where Jesus said to remember him. And I would like to ask you today, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you believe that he is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the only hope for life after death in Jesus Christ? I hope that you have. 
And I know that many of you have done that and you live for Jesus and you love him and you worship him every day, both with your praises and also with your life, how you live. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. He that believes in me shall never die. Though he dies, yet shall he live. I would like you to pray this prayer with me. And maybe you have never prayed a prayer like this before. But you can be born again. You can be a child of God and be assured of resurrection after your death. If you will pray this prayer with me and mean it in your heart. Dear Father, I know I've sinned. I ask you to forgive my sin. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I give you my life. I give you everything I am, everything I hope to be. Save me right now. Make me a real Christian. Help me to live for you from now on. Help me to understand your word. Help me to tell others about your love. Thank you for coming into my heart. Amen. Thank you for joining me for communion today. I'm glad you're here. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Because we do not want to bring judgment on ourselves, let us take a moment and let us examine ourselves. Let us make sure that we are right with God. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please grab your bread. Let us pray. Bless this bread, Lord, as a reminder of Christ's sacrifice and of the unity of this body. Let us take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, and remember remembrance of me. Let us take our cups. Let us pray. Bless the cup as a sharing in the death of Christ, as we die to ourselves to live for you. Thank you for your love and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the cup together. Thank you for joining me in communion today. Pastor Julie. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority, both now and forevermore. Amen.